All right, I'm going to introduce Jim briefly. I'm actually <laughs> going to read what I, um, what I wrote here. Uh, Jim Hickman is a board chair and professor of neuroscience at Ubiquity University. After his first trip to Moscow in 1972, Jim was active for the next 35 years developing economic and professional relationships between the United States and the USSR, Russia. For the past 15 years, he's been a student of contemplative practice in neuroscience. He's written numerous articles for such publications as the Wall Street Journal Europe, the Moscow Times, and Inc. Magazine. He's currently writing a book on how the latest discoveries in quantum physics, epigenetics, and neuroscience, when combined with the teachings of wisdom traditions, inform us about successful living in turbulent times. He lives in Bogota with his wife, his 15-year-old son, a golden retriever, and Changa, their cat friend. Jim, the floor is yours. Oh, thanks, thanks. Wendy, that's a nice picture you have on your, whatever we yeah. call it, our logo or something, on our, on our um, Zoom things. Oh, that's even a nicer picture. Where are you, Wendy? Oh, this is my aspirational living room with the, the fire that doesn't move. That's a good one. A good one. <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> well, and in fact, I was saying earlier before a few of you joined us that I added a couple of slides. Um, so let me just get um, introduce it here because um, we're going to focus on the practices. And um, but I want everyone to have a paper and a pen or pencil because we're going to do a couple of as we go through them, we'll do a couple of the exercises that require some writing. <coughs> Um, so have that um, um, accessible. And then I wanted to explain something actually Roger asked me about after the last class, that at the uh, sort of toward the end of the slides and everyone will get a PDF and a copy of the video, um, there's a list of references. And, you know, I go through these relatively quickly um, and, and because you'll get the PDFs, you know, I recommend that people just, you know, go through it with me as an experience because you can always, because they're meant to go back to and look at um, more specifically. My experience has been that some of these exercises appeal to people um, differently than others. And so it's important once you get a sense of something that might be attractive to you, you can go back to the slide and see more specifically, you know, how, how it might impact you or others, etc. cetera. Um, and at the end of the show, there's a list of references. Um, I'm hoping, hi, Julia. Is it Julia or Julia? Ju Julita, Julita. It's Julita. Julita. <laughs> Unita. Or Coco. Unita. Maybe oh, it's your you Coco. Coco. <laughs> and where, where are you? That's exactly right. I, uh -huh. I'm currently in Europe, but I live in New York past 10 years. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, there's several people here in Europe, London. Um, and I don't know, I didn't ask everybody, but we have a couple of people in uh, the United Kingdom. I don't know, do we still use that? Is it true anymore? <laughs> um, you know, this uh, geography changes. Um, um, so anyway, I wanted to mention that a part of the purpose here is to introduce us all to concepts and opportunities to learn more. Because this is just, you know, an introduction to various pieces of information and practices. So the references allow you to dive more deeply into some aspect of what we talk about. Um, so keep that in mind. Then we'll do a couple of short exercises as we go through, after each of which we'll have a short discussion about what we've been talking about. Out. So as you come up with questions, comments, etc., put them in the chat and Angela will monitor it as will I and we'll answer some of those questions in the uh, discussion session and we'll have, you know, a few other, we'll have opportunity for everyone to gang up 
on one another, not just me. Um, and then again, I'm gonna begin with a few concepts, a review of a few concepts we went through before uh, with a little bit of a different angle and perspective. So I'm gonna get started on that now. Um, and I think all of you can see this. So I am going to make this an okay. So here we are again. And I've last time I talked a little about hypercomplexity, but now I'm more interested in what I call becoming more fully human. Um, and so I have one more of my little sayings in here alongside these more eminent and um, well-known scholars, Rick Hansen and Carlos Schatz, that becoming more fully human through mindful attention to responsibility for each of our own experience. And that, you know, is more fully explained in what uh, the slide I edited a little, but I presented last time. And this is, you know, there's a YouTube on this by Anil Seth. Um, that consciousness is related to our nature as living and breathing organisms and bringing awareness of both our inner and the outer world. So as Seth points out, the brain combines sensory signals with internal prior expectations and beliefs about the way the world is. And the perception of those signals comes from both outside and the inside. Um, so we don't just passively perceive the world, we actually generate our perception of the world because the world we experience comes as much from the inside as from the outside in. So I wanted to um, say a couple of things. Uh, in September uh, at Ubiquity, I'm gonna do a next course. It's four Thursdays in September each uh, meeting is an hour and a half on uh, right now my co-teacher and I are calling it applied neuroscience too because I've taught it several times um, conscious evolution and um, my preference is becoming more fully human but there is an, a lexicon now in the more popular um, uh, language about conscious evolution. Several different practitioners and teachers are talking about it. So it's another way of looking at it. I, you know, my own view is that we've got all of this stuff in us now and our, and our endeavor is to actualize more of who we really are. Jim accidentally hit his mute button, so we can't hear him. Oh, it was me. Am I muted? No, not anymore. Are you interfering with my incredible speech, Jim? <laughs> I was actually muting everyone else, and I, 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 I muted you by accident. Sorry. Um, no, well, you know, depends on what Freud would say. <laughs> Maybe this is challenging to you and you're, um, but, but, you know, the basic idea is that, that we can become conscious participants in our own evolution. Now, of course, technically evolution is about uh, um, a passing down and changing of genes and DNA, et cetera, over hundreds, if not thousands of years. So I look at it more like we've got this in us and now, especially with our brain, our heart and our gut where all these neurons interact, we have the capacity to more fully actualize them and realize our potential to become human beings that, that as I would put it, um, are more expressive of compassion, um, connectedness to other living beings. In a sense, um, realizing those characteristics we have within us that can, that can create a more sustainable and, and equitable civilization for all living systems on the earth. 
Um, and it's about taking responsibility for who we really are so that we can consciously choose who we want to be. And um, there's a group in, uh, at the University of Helsinki um, called the Conscious Evolution Research Group. And it's it doing some interesting work in, and what it defines is that our current situation is that algorithms, governments, other parties can, they know, they know us better than we know ourselves. And they can influence our decisions through the media and video clips and music and speeches that have an effect on our emotions that underlie our decisions. And so the more we become conscious of our internal experience and how it relates to what happens outside of us, the more we can make our own, make our own sort of conscious choices about life rather than um, um, becoming sort of unwitting um, components of what governments and others, political leaders, et cetera, want us to do. And of course, as we mentioned last time, the two of the main parts of the brain that are involved in this are the amygdala and the prefrontal cortex, um, which, which we've discussed. But I wanted to, to review just a minute again the role of the neurons, because this is an important part of who we are that we want to remember. And again, as I mentioned, we now know that the brain, the heart, and the gut are all connected through their neuronal components in ways that, that affect one another in a significant, to a significant degree. And um, as we've said, you know, each neuron, which you can see up here, is connected um, to other neurons. And it's important to remember, each neuron connects to approximately 5,000 other neurons. And we're talking about 85 to 100 billion neurons. Um, and those connections are firing around 50 times a second. And they spread across the brain to connect different parts of the brain through neural networks. When these, when these neurons connect, we call them neural networks and they reflect how we think, how we feel, how we act in the world. So what we're doing with the neuroscience inspired practices is creating the kind of neural networks that will reflect thoughts, emotions, act actions of who we really want to be, not just, again, the algorithms of the government, et cetera, who are trying to make us into what they want us to be. And the imagination is important. I didn't talk about it last time, but I wanted to emphasize it and distinguish between the science of using the imagination and what many of us imagine the imagination can do. So in the beginning, I'm the first three little sections there, I'm talking about the science, which is mainly the research has been with athletes or people um, um, imagining internally functions of the body. So for example, they found that people who imagine shooting a basketball into the net for a while before they shoot um, actually make more baskets than those who don't. Jack Nicholas is one of the most well-known, in a sense, imaginers. He always said that before he makes a golf shot, he imagines all of the details of where that ball is gonna go through the air, land, and where it's gonna stop. So he used his imagination to become one of the greatest golfers of all times. Um, and the last part is that that's not enough. You also have to act it out. So when, you're, um, when athletes use internal images to rehearse mental rehearsal of you know, their actions, then physical training is crucial. And what often uh, is left out of some of these trainings that inspire you to imagine what your future is to be is that 
it, it leaves out how important then the actions you take actually bring that into reality. So affecting your desired future, you can create an image of that future and feel as if it already exists. And then you use those images to carry out the efforts it takes to get there. So it's both things. So when you imagine your success, you'll be more attuned to opportunities that can help you get there. See, it's about paying attention. So I wanted to just um, take a moment and go through the vagus nerve breathing exercise once again, because it's a, it's a very important recentering exercise that we can do very simply uh, throughout the day when we feel a little flustered. So just sit quietly for a moment. It's, it's probably easiest to close your eyes. And if you remember from last time, place one hand at the base of the throat where the vagus nerve reaches the upper part of the body. And we basically caress the nerve as we move the hand down the center of the body to the navel. And then we put the second hand up and we'll do this for just 30 seconds or a minute. And that has a real impact on this vagus nerve that controls the mood, your heart rate, digestion, immune, immune response, stimulating the vagus nerve helps regulate these things. And in the COVID world, regulating and strengthening your immune response purely through a simple little massage down the front of your body is an important exercise as we learn more and more about how our immune system can be strengthened in this COVID-19 environment. So one more little pass and just breathe into it. Breathe slowly into the sensation that has now been circulating through your heart, your lungs, your colon, etc and come back to the present moment. So I wanted to stop for just a minute here and, um, and see how we're doing. See if there's any comments yet, questions, um, a short discussion. Does anyone want to say anything? I would, this is Laurie, I unmuted myself. Uh, we learned that Vegas breathing last time and I have used it several times since. One night I took a overdose of melatonin, like 30 milligrams, which I heard was much, much, much too much because I heard it was useful in a pro post vaccine. Oh, something or other, you know, I just listened. And I was nervous that maybe I would be, go to sleep and not wake up. <laughs> so even though nobody, dies with melatonin, but I did this and I've done it several other times and I do find it very soothing. Great, thank you. Thank you. And, and for me, um, this is in a sense, the most important part of what we do together is learning which practices work for us in what way. And, you know, just to hear Lori, that it has a positive impact on your relationship to whatever it is you were doing um, is a very important piece because we're talking, you know, a minute or two minutes of just caressing the front of your body. I mean, it's so simple and it really has an impact on that. So thank you, Lori. If I could add, what it did was it took away my fear. I was able to then, I said, I'd better go to bed. So I just went to sleep, but I didn't go with obsessive thoughts. After I did this, I felt calmed. So that was it. Hey. I have a question as well. Yes. 
So uh, we said, you said that like new thoughts and new emotions will create new narrow paths, like new neurons. And I have a question, how is still like creating those new narrow paths in our brain? How, do that, how does that affect our reality? Not in terms of what we experience, because that's kind of understand that part, but in terms of like, when we start attracting to ourselves. For example, let's say I am um, changing my beliefs uh, and relationship with money and success. And I'm starting to tell myself I am worthy of success and wealth. And then all of the sudden, um, this money is just showing up right and left, which has happened to me before when I was doing those exercises. And then when I stop, it stops happening. It's almost like I have to... So I just don't understand, is it has to do with quantum physics, if, with um, affecting the reality, the universe? Like that's one part that I don't get. Like, why do I start attracting these things to myself? Okay, so there are two parts to it. One is sort of what happens inside of you on a regular and normal, in a sense, normal physiological basis that affects your experience of, of the world. The other part is a more sign of philosophical, theoretical, somewhat scientific thing about quantum physics and the universe. So, you know, like you, for example, you know, my own belief is that the universe is abundant. There is no, there is no not enough for everybody. There are only those of us who believe there are. And what we know is that our beliefs have a huge impact on how we see the world and therefore how the world reacts to us in a certain way. Now, but going back to number one, again, you're talking about your unconscious. You know, in the unconscious, that we carry these different beliefs, some of which are, you know, in relation to money, you have to work hard to get it, there isn't enough for everybody, blah, blah, blah. And in order to overcome that, you have to do the kind of things you're doing for a certain amount of time. And, you know, one of the people who, whom I like, who talks, um, who teaches about this is a man named John Asaroff. And he does a course you know, several courses on, you know, abundance and business, making successful business, et cetera. He says that you really need to practice what you're describing for at least a hundred days in order to change this, the unconscious thought process that has created a habit that in a sense, you know, now we get a little metaphysical and philosophical, but creates an energetic um, aspect of who you are that either pushes abundance away or brings it to you. And depending on your, your definition of abundance, that could be cash, that could be a wide variety of things. Um, and so, you know, there's that aspect of the unconscious, which is at the, in a sense, at the heart of most of the beliefs that run us. And my, my, comments in the beginning about governments, politicians, etc. They, they learn about how to stimulate your unconscious beliefs in their favor. And what we're talking about is learning practices that rewire, because again, the unconscious belief is wired into a neural network that has been there a long time, most of your life, let's say, um, depending on, you know, when it first came in. And so the practices are about changing that neural network. And what literally what seems to happen in the brain is that let's say I have a neural network that is emerged out of an unconscious belief that um, I'm not good enough, okay, for whatever. Literally what seems to happen as I pursue a rewiring of my unconscious of that unconscious belief is the neural network that is holding that thought in a sense I'm not good enough 
begins to disassemble. Remember, there are 5,000 connections from dendrite to, to other neurons. And that begins to disassemble itself. Those community of neurons stop talking to each other, stop sending neurochemicals, start, stop, da, da, da. and a new wiring takes place that creates a neural network in the brain connecting all different aspects of the brain that is around, I am good enough. I'm a good person. I'm talented. I can get whatever I want in life. Da, 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 da. So, um, you know, that's that aspect. Then there's the quantum physics stuff. I talked about it last time. And, you know, quantum physics, to be practical, nobody really understands that world. We have a whole lot of mathical, mathematical descriptions of it that give us insight into, again, our own brain-connected idea of how it then manifests. But given that, I'll, you know, I'll, I'll go with you into that world because there, there are a couple of things. Oh, and recently, two weeks, uh, February 15th, in a, science, in a science journal came a, an article about new research that says in the quantum world, cause and effect may be a circular experience, meaning that in some cases, the effect actually creates the cause. So, you know, it's in the quantum world, time is a separate dimension than the rest. And when we think about cause and effect, it's a time related thing. But I found it interesting because one of the experiences, just my own personal, you know, fantasy, let's say, but one of my own experiences is that, that sometimes when I'm doing these exercises, I have a sense that the future Jim is calling to the present Jim saying, yes, do that and you'll get what you want to be because I'm here being that, you know? So in the quantum world, all these little, according to the way the mathematics works, all these little possibilities seem to be there because what we do know is that, that in, in, in a pure quantum reality, there is no physical physicality until what they call the, they're just probabilities, lots of possibilities. And what we call the probability wave collapses when there is a tension placed on it. Now, you know, our human orientation is that when a human says something about it. I mean, I'm like, what about all the other living systems that have intention? So I just say, when attention is put on the probability wave, it collapses into the reality that is the, that is the image that attention has given to it, something like that. Does that make sense? Because I don't know what I'm talking about, but it makes sense to me. So, you know, I describe it this way. Is that better? Does that help you? Okay, good. Uh, yeah, I definitely, and you made me feel better when you said no one really gets quantum physics 100% because I'm always so overwhelmed on this subject, but I know it works, so whatever I'm doing, so exactly. I'm just going to continue doing it. Somehow, the, somehow this world that we see outside of us collapsed into this reality, and and it seems to, at its fundamental fundamental platform, let's say, seems to be in the quantum world. So um, I, think, I think mind, consciousness, awareness has an impact. And if we direct our attention, regardless of how it works, if we direct our attention on who we want to become, what we want to have, et cetera, then what you just said, we set up an energetic, an energy of attraction that it's sort of like this, you know, um, when you imagine, okay, I, let's imagine, okay, I want to make a million dollars this year. Now, again, it goes back to what I said earlier. So let's say there's a bunch of gold in the mountain and the universe sets up the conditions in which all that gold gets turned into a million dollars. 
but it doesn't come to me unless I create the opportunity for that to happen. See, I have to take the action that then is fits the, the attraction that brings it into my life. You see what I mean? Okay, so going on, <laughs> you know, we get into this and I get lost a little. Yes, Suzanne. Uh, you're on mute, Suzanne. I'm sorry. Okay, yeah. so this is my question. So aren't we also sort of at effect of human consciousness in general? For example, um, the people around us believe in scarcity and there's not enough food, even though we ourselves might say there's plenty wouldn't we then sort of be affected by their beliefs? And, you know, I think about the virus. I'm sure a lot of people were doing visualizations that they were healthy and strong and invincible. And yet probably many of them got the virus and became very sick. So how do, how do those two work together? The sort of like element of consciousness in general and what it's creating versus our individual um, focus on what we want to create for ourselves. Well, no one has the answer, but I can tell you what I think. Um, yes, it's important in this kind of a way of operating in the world or in the universe, it's important to surround yourself with people who are of a similar, you know, um, um, belief in a sense. So if you want to stay positive, be with positive people. Don't spend all your time with naysayers. So in that sense, yes, the impact of, for example, the impact of what I believe on the person sitting next to me is, is real, just as his or her belief system has an impact on mine. And so there is a, there is a relationship among all the people, without a doubt. Um, I would also say that, you know, the way I would look at COVID is that, that on the one hand, I don't believe I will get it. On the other hand, I make sure of that because I wear a mask and I practice social distancing. You see, it's not just about belief, it's about the action that you take in the world as well. So both things have to happen. You can't just be absolutely certain that you're never gonna get sick and then walk into a room where nobody has on masks and they're all sick and contaminated um, because the virus <laughs> has its own possibilities for, you know, in, in a sense, invading your space. And so um, we also wanna protect against that. Yes, Suzanne. So um, would you say, or do you think that some people are sort of more naturally gifted in this respect in terms of creating reality, like they sort of just aren't naturally born with a little more capacity. Like some people have more emotional intelligence just innately. Do some people have more sort of innate ability to visualize and create for themselves than maybe other people or are we all sort of similar? Well, I think we all have the capacity to do this. We don't all have the motivation, the intent, the attention, the, and that's where I say um, we have the opportunity to become more fully human. We have, all of us have the opportunity to activate these capacities, but we have to be willing to, it's like, you know, um, um, what do they say? Oh yeah, there's a joke. How many therapists does it take to change a light bulb? Only one but the light bulb has to want to change. You see, so there's an active participation we each have in realizing and bringing to the surface these capacities to have a direct impact on the world we live in. So I'm gonna move on here, okay, because there's some other things we wanna talk about, but please, anyone else who has similar um, questions Bring them up because we're getting to them. And um, I'm going to say, say something really quickly. Go um, ahead. Yes, please. So anyway, this is this is this thing is um, scheduled for like an hour, and it's quite clear that you're going to go over. So um, I'm just going to put that out there. Uh, 
I do have a, a question, Jim. I'm sorry, what was that? I said, I do have a question. Okay. Uh, are you okay? Uh, so I, I had a really fascinating experience with the practice of EFT, which is basically tapping based on traditional Chinese medicine and a psychological and physical phenomenon. And I want to hear your thoughts about what I experienced because the way it unfolded was really fascinating to me, especially in the context of thinking about the neuron, a, a, a path created with the neurons and how it was disconnected. So I did a tapping session for a thought that was really habitual. And then a few days later, I was, the thought came up after I had done the, the traditional Chinese medicine tapping thing a few days later. And I felt my mind, actually I should say, I felt my brain searching for the emotional chemical hit typically related to the thought, but that had been disconnected. And when it couldn't find the biochemical hit, it dropped the thought. And so that was a, it blew my mind when I had that experience. It was very conscious of what had happened. And it was fascinating for me to watch, to observe my brain hunting for the chemical hit. What was fascinating is that energy medicine, the traditional Chinese medicine, disconnected the biochemical emotional association with the thought. And I was just curious if you had a comment about that, the physicality and the, the, the junction with energy medicine and the physicality and the neurons, because it, it was really clear to me what was happening biochemically in my body. Let's do this, Wendy. Um, a couple of the exercises will speak to that. So I'm going to go on and let's get back to that question when you see um, how it relates to something. So a few other um, a few other slides of review from last time because they're important as we remember. Um, for the last two hundred fifty thousand years, our our neural system has taken on a bias to remember, feel, incorporate, react with a negativity uh, uh, experience in a broad spectrum of, of opportunities, let's say. So it's something built into us. And um, it, it's sort of like, is interesting because I thought of it the other day when um, you might have seen that U.S. President Abias, um, Biden um, uh, criticized the Texas governor as Neanderthal thinking. Mm. And, and that's, that's going back to these fundamental hardwiring systems that came from, in a sense, mother nature, the evolutionary impulse to preserve the species. And now, um, much of that we don't need anymore, but we still react to it. So it's, you know, I, I like what Rick Hansen has always said, our brain is Velcro for negative experience and Teflon for positive ones. So the remedy is not to um, try and do away with them, but to recognize them and replace them with positive emotions, such as optimism, gratitude, compassion, et cetera. Um, and part of this is related to what you were asking, Wendy, in a certain way, um, because to make this work, there has to be a deep emotional arousal. That's really an essential element of affecting a shift in the structure and form of the brain. Um, and so the more we recognize a kind of mindfulness practice, acknowledge, um, 
what's coming up and going back to what you were saying, Wendy, you know, while that experience is extraordinary, incredible and, and rewarding, at the same time, when we're when our intent is to move into daily life with a set of exercises that can restructure our brain, then what we have to remember is to pay attention to what's happening in this moment and then use some of these um, um, exercises to weave neural pathways in the brain because it is, as we've learned over the last 20 years, it has this capacity for what we call self-directed neuroplasticity. And to do that, as I was saying, yet it you have to act, you go from activation to installation. And that means that uh, say you, um, my boss is yelling at me for being late to work. And so, you know, it activates my, my amygdala a little bit and I get an emotional response. And, and then my practice is just settle for a moment into a kind of mindfulness second to acknowledge, okay, that's how I'm feeling. Now I'm going to um, bring up the positivity of who I am in the, you can do it in the workplace, you know, to myself and say, whoa, I really love this job and da, da, da. And, and so you activate a positive, in a sense, replacement of the negativity that was stimulated. And then it's from activation to installation. You have to sink into that positive feeling deeply and hold it within your being for 15 to 20 seconds. I mean, you can start with five seconds. I, and, and I've said before, um, it's a little strange to do this um, with, with, you know, in the midst of things. And I'll give you an example. After the last class, I was talking to Roger about how the class went. And he said to me, well, Jim, first of all, you know, I, you, I love about you, your enthusiasm and your, and he gave me several compliments. And my response was, oh, thanks, Raj. What about this and that? And then I went back to it and I said, Roger, see, that's exactly the opportunity to say, thank you, Roger. Look how good that feels. Now, it's a little strange in the midst of your conversation with someone to say, hold it just a minute. Give me 15 seconds. I'm going to feel how wonderful that is. But if you do it, it changes your brain over time. And so these experiences, these opportunities occur somewhat regularly throughout a day. And it takes a kind of mindfulness, attention, awareness to um, th that opportunity in order to remember to install it. It activates it. Roger says, oh, I loved your talk. It activates, oh, that feels good. But then I got to install it. Oh, let me take that in. And now, what you can do is then, then, in a sense, file it, remember. And then after you're done, take a moment for yourself. In, in Wendy, what you were saying, recreate in your mind, in your neural networks, the experience of what just happened and install it in a 15 to 20 second experience of how wonderful it felt. And that moves it from the short-term memory to long-term storage. And that has a um, direct and semi-permanent effect on the neural networks in the brain. So as the, as Rick Hansen says, you become more compassionate by repeatedly installing experiences of compassion or grateful by repeatedly installing experiences of gratitude. And, um, and, and what William Sam said a long time ago, attention, see, that's what's crucial, attention. The light bulb has to want to be replaced, pay attention to knowing from moment to moment, 
You can sculpt your brain because it changes with every experience, feeling, thought, et cetera. And you can choose who you want to be in the next moment in a very real sense. Uh, Jim Roger had a question. Yeah, go ahead. I just had a, a, a thought about installing the sense of gratitude uh, dynamically and not just having to get weird on somebody and go, well, let me take this in. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it, is, it is, in fact, just to give the feedback that go, stop and you go, oh, <laughs> thanks. That's really nice of you. I, I appreciate that. I took, um, it's hard for me to accept compliments, but uh, from you, uh, it's an, and then just explain what it feels like. Um, and then uh, that gives a little bit of the, that installation. Weirdness. Yeah, without Weirdness. having, it's less it's weird than having to close your eyes and go, hmm, <laughs> let me take this. In. And it has that, that yeah. delightful effect of your, your, your acknowledging what somebody else did. And it's rare that people toss off compliments and then have somebody stop and uh, go, hey, thank you. I'll take that in. Yeah, and, and you know, what I would add to that is, yes, thank you very much, Roger. I feel really good when you say that, to, you know, so that, so that you are consciously installing it into your system by relating to the other person. And, 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 and so thank you. I appreciate that. Um, and so then, you know, a few more comments just on self-directed neuroplasticity. Again, recognize the positive experience, enrich it by installing it and extend it in time for 20 to 30 seconds and do it several times a day. And the body begins to create a preference for positive over negative experiences. So you begin to counter the evolutionary impulse of 250,000 years um, to prefer the positive and just spend a little time with the positive. Because as we all know, when we review our day, it's so much easier to remember the negative side than it is all the small little positive things that happen. And, you know, I like this life is made of minutes and we have a brain that's constantly changing its structure based on those moments. So the opportunity is to turn good moments into a great brain. You can use your mind to change your brain, to change your mind for the better, to benefit ourselves and other beings. And it, and it emphasizes that our experience matters, both for how it feels in the moment, but also for the lasting revenue it, residue that it leaves behind. Um, and, and again, I go back to mindful attention. Attention is like a spotlight lighting what it rests upon and attention pulls the contents of your experience into the brain. So you wanna direct attention skillfully over time. And one of the benefits of mindfulness training is development of skillful attention because mindfulness is about paying attention to your thoughts, being alert, how to different thoughts connect and training your mind to work for you instead of against you. So the practices, we've touched on this, taking in the good. This is just what we were talking about. It's about increasing your neural pathways based on regularity and depth of positive feeling and experience. So look for them and they're all around us all day. Mostly we just don't pay attention to them. But every time we take in the good, we build a little bit of neural structure. We do it a few times a day, <coughs> and then that neural structure begins to expand. And it turns everyday good experiences into good neural structures. <coughs> and I like this, it gets back to self-care. Treat yourself as if you matter. So then um, Rick Hansen has a little acronym HEAL have a positive experience, enrich it, absorb it, sense it sinking into you. And then you can also, from a therapeutic point of view, you can link the positive with the negative material so that you can actually shift that particular stimulus from a negative experience 
into something more po positive and begin to shift it in your unconscious. So just be aware and then let it go and rest in the positive. Then gratitude, we talked a bit about it last time and there's so much out there you know, on gratitude these days. Roger just pointed to it. Um, Wendy commented on it, how incredible it felt and how extraordinary the experience was. And there again, you can, you know, I'm so grateful for that experience. This, this simple, regular expressions of gratitude um, have an incredible impact on our health. And I just wanted to, you know, this is the great little um, image. We have happiness in the middle because grateful people um, exhibit a more happy attitude toward life than people who are not very grateful. But if we look at each one just in the middle, emotional, more resilience. And we know, you know, it's come out of the COVID thing is, we need to develop a more resilient approach to life because the unknowns are gonna continue. And then social, kinder. People who are grateful are kinder in their relationships with others, more optimistic in their personality um, and, and live longer, you know, improve sleep, less sick, et cetera. I mean, um, Lori, alluded to this in, in her little uh, experience about getting going to sleep. Because there was a sense of, as she did the, the um, vagus nerve exercise, a sense of gratitude for it took away her fear. And, you know, that's, a, that's an opportunity, just very simply. Thank you, thank you very much for this exercise because it took away my fear. I'm very grateful for that. You know, when I walk the dog in the morning, um, it, it's a perfect time. Wow, brother, son, how grateful. I'm very grateful for your warmth and the, and the light that you shed. It's such a beautiful morning. Thank you, thank you. And then career-wise, grateful people um, are more successful generally in their work. So then a few things, and we're gonna do one exercise here quickly. So get out your little paper and pencil, but a, 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 um, a well-promoted approach is to create a gratitude journal. Um, just every night before you go to sleep, write down a list of five things for which you're grateful, just simple. And research shows that if you do it just once a week and you write it in a little more detail, um, it has a significant positive impact on your health, on your happiness, on those various um, uh, examples I gave in the image before. So I wanna just do this quickly um, and simply. Take out your piece of paper and just a list, three items for which we're, you're grateful, just write down, I'm grateful for, and then one of those items I'd like you to identify a person in your life. I'm grateful for the friendship of so-and-so. So please just write those down and feel into the gratitude that comes with acknowledging this incredible, these incredible three things in your life. And then I have a few little uh, other suggestions here. And, <laughs> you know, I'm, it's, it's not quite so easy now because with COVID, so many of us work from home with the rest of our family. Like my 15 year old son is on the, is in his room taking his classes. And my wife is in her room doing her work. And I'm in my room doing my work. When it was, when I was alone, Number three was easy. I would, I would once or twice a day just get the music on and you know have a little dance around. Whoa! I'm so I'm so happy and grateful that I'm alone, so I could do this dance. Or 
when you wake up, just say thank you out loud or to yourself if you don't want to bother someone else who's sleeping for five things in your life for what you're thank you thank you for having a really great rest and like i am always thank you for this very comfortable bed i have um now it, i don't know if you just heard the little alarm it said it's 1700 hours yeah five o'clock so I, what, what I, I keep that on so that on the hour, every hour, I get a little voice in my ear that says it's 1700 hours. The top of, and what I do is that's a, that's a reminder for me to take 30 seconds and say what I'm grateful for. So that's right now. That's what just happened. We had the grateful alarm, everyone just in your mind quietly. I'm really grateful for my friendship with Roger. I'm really grateful that my car starts every morning. I'm really grateful for the incredibly enthusiastic dog that just never cares about the things that bother me. Um, I'm grateful that I have enough to eat and a roof over my head. And then um, the other one that is important is that is to contact people in your life who've had a positive impact on you and let them know you appreciate them. You can send them an email, a chat, um, call them on the do you use phones anymore? Yeah, iPhones, yeah. Um, or, you know, on Skype or whatever, tell them live or write it down. And, and a part of what happens that we often don't see is that these kinds of expressions, in a sense, energetic expressions of goodwill, of gratitude, of love and caring, ripple into the world in a significant way. And, we, we mostly will never know all of the impacts that energetic ripple has, but it's there and it affects those around us. Um, and I like this little quote, he's a wise man or woman who does not grieve for the things which he has not. And there again, the negativity bias, we tend to complain about what we don't have, but the wise person rejoices for those things which he or she has. That's where the focus is. And that's a part of the positivity um, replacement of the negativity bias. So there's a, a YouTube video when you get this, I recommend you watch it. Uh, last time it wasn't very successful in this link up, but it, it focuses on uncertainty, the kind of world we're in today. Um, and it's a nice little, very short uh, YouTube video on gratitude in, um, in a world of uncertainty. Then I showed this last time, but I like this quote of gratitude word drug. It would be the most popular drug in the world because of its positive impact on us. Everything from it makes us happier and, and makes people like us down to it makes us healthier and boosts our career. And so I put the little reference at the bottom um, that you can read more about it. Then appreciation is exercise number three. It relates to and is related to gratitude, um, but it also has its own power. And, and the HeartMath Institute um, really emphasizes this. And here's a little exercise that you can follow very simply. We're not gonna do it right now, um, but it moves you into the heart um, and begins to energize, activate the heart-centered neuronal structure and connection to the brain. That's very, very important for much of what the um, questions have been about. How do we make all of this work? And the heart focus breathing and feeling into it, especially with a grateful feeling about someone you care about or a close friend from the heart um, has, a, has a significant impact 
on outside of yourself and inside of your, yourself. So engage the power of your heart to generate and sustain feelings of appreciation. So here's a little exercise. Um, again, we're going to do this very briefly. But first, just take appreciation breaks each day. And again, like my top of the hour um, um, notification, it's also a time to just write down quickly what I appreciate most. So we want to do this, get your paper out, and just three things. A list of three things that you appreciate. Like I really appreciate living here in Cochabamba. I really appreciate my cats. I'm writing them down now. And then you can, you know, I often write it on a small piece of paper like this. And then I put it in my pocket. So, um, you know, all day I can take one out and then remember. I appreciate, whoa, you know, something's not quite happening. And so I can shift the neuronal structure, the neuronal network that is around the negativity experience of something that's going on and move my attention into a, a, a community of neurons that begin to activate themselves around the thought, the feeling, the action of appreciations rather than, and begin to disassemble that neural network that focuses on what I don't have or what someone did to me that is really not very appreciative. I like this, you know, people will forget what you said, they'll forget what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. And that goes back to Roger's comment. Roger says something really nice to me. And as you can tell, I remember it. I don't quite remember what you were wearing that day, Roger, but I remember that comment. And then as Roger said, I can say back to you an equally positive thing and you'll remember that whole interaction. So they always we always remember how people make us feel. And then this moves us into, you know, this exercise that, that I sort of coined the phrase of back pocket positivity. It's a larger example of what we just went through. And this is something to do on your own, but I really recommend it to take, you know, five minutes now and then of quiet time and go back into experiences you remember that were extraordinarily positive, a birthday celebration, uh, uh, an achievement where there was lots of acknowledgement, etc. Um, your first ride on a horse that was very successful and how thrilling it was. And deepen that into your, in a sense, memory, body memory, mind, brain, heart, gut, so that you can keep carry that memory, the positive feeling of that memory with you throughout your day. And then put that in your back pocket, much like the little appreciation list um, that I showed you that I put here. But these are bigger, more intense, in a sense, more deeply installed positive memories because of what happened in that time. And you put it in your back pocket. So in a very trying moment of sort of negativity or emotional challenge, you can bring up that really deep feeling of positivity from your past primarily. And, and because it's installed in your brain, your heart and your gut, it can very quickly overcome the depth of, of emotional, in a sense, negativity, threat, bad feelings that um, have occurred because of whatever uh, was going on. 
then I remind us that um, all of these experiences, times throughout the day are moments of choice. We always have a choice of what's happening within us and whether or not we want to give it energy on the negative side. Oh, that guy really is yelling at me. I don't like him. I really or we want to increase the positive side. We want to dampen that negativity a little bit and increase the positive sense, either through back pocket positivity or looking at your appreciation list or, um, or one of these other exercises. And it's about attention, being with the experience and then making a wise effort to turn it into the kind of experience you want to be typical of who you are. Know the mind, shape the mind, and free the mind from the government and politics and all the rest of that. The news that keeps us focused on the suffering of the world. Then of course, kindness. Be kind whenever possible. Um, it, it's, it's available almost all the time throughout the day. And it has a loving quality. And so we call it loving kindness. And in your brain, loving kindness um, mobilizes certain aspects of the brain that um, are related to emotional and reward networks. It, it, um, it actually stimulates oxytocin and, endor and endorphins in the, in the brain and initiates brainstem arousal. It, um, and it's, a, it's an aspect of being on your own side, practicing loving kindness with yourself. And this comes out of Rick Hansen's book, Buddha, Buddha's Brain. And then I like this one, Random Acts of Kindness, um, in which the research shows that the college students increase their sense of happiness simply by counting their acts of kindness for one week. That's all it takes. So one, uh, one practice is at the end of the day, just make a short list of the acts of kindness that you experienced, expressed to others throughout the day. Um, it makes other people happy. And once again, it has a ripple effect that is beyond what we imagine. Um, and um, here are a few examples. I like this one. When you're standing in line, well, we don't stand in line very much anymore. But sometimes, and now more than ever, as, as certain states are opening up their businesses, um, the person behind you, buy them a cup of coffee or a muffin, just you know, as an act of kindness. Genuine compliments about something you like about some, someone. Spend one to 10 seconds enjoying the good feeling, taking in the good when that happens to you. And I like this one, write a kind message for someone on a piece of paper and slip it into their purse or bag um, when they're not looking. And then, you know, they go home and open it. Whoa, that's an incredible thing that you've done to that person's day. And then share your list, it's important to, to express who you are through this sharing of your list of appreciations, of acts of kindness, of, of, um, of other aspects of this. Now, this is harder. I'm finding it more and more difficult in COVID because of the mask. Um, I, you know, like to smile, genuine smile, smiles, because I enjoy, I, I just enjoy being out there in the world and seeing what people do. Um, and smiling is a significant indicator of your positive interactions with others and it can change your brain. I like what Mother Teresa says, we never, we shall never know all the good that a simple smile can do. And it tells our brain that it, we feel good. And when our, when our brain feels good, it tells us to smile because it stimulates our brain's reward mechanisms. And as the, as the research shows, 
even better than chocolate, um, which is a well-regarded pleasure inducer. Um, so the smile, and then there was a study done with all these little emojis, and they found that the smile is the symbol rated with the highest positive emotional content of all of those other um, little symbols that we sometimes put in our emails or our chats. Then a simple practice before you're about to have a conversation with someone, um, visualize someone you love and recall an event that brought you deep satisfaction. In other words, create a feeling and an experience which elicits genuinely a smile on your face. And that will have a positive impact on then the following conversation or interaction with the person. So I'm gonna um, take a break and just see where we are. This is a, there are a few other um, uh, slides that we can go through and that you can look at, but um, let's just see where we are in terms of, of conversation, discussion, people, timing, we're 15 minutes over. So we'll finish the next 10 minutes or so, but um, it's your turn, gallery as it says. What do we have? We now have 10 participants. We've had a few more than that, so a few people had to leave, obviously. Um, questions, comments? I, I, have a, I have a question for you, Jim. Um, how, and, and maybe it's just a piece of advice anyone could tell me. Like, I agree with everything you've said. And I understand everything you've said. Um, my friend's daughter died a couple of weeks ago and we're burying her on Tuesday. And my friend is, was kind of depressed before. And this is kind of knocked her for six. So in terms of, is there any kind of exercise? That, like, I don't know how you would rewire your brain from losing your one of your kids. You know what I mean? You know, like, and I don't want to be going in or think positive and all that because she'll just probably tell me to, you know, go forth and multiply and that. But I, I want to be able to give her something that she could do without me going into a load of stuff because she'll just look at me and go, are you off your head? <laughs> so is there anything for loss, that, any exercises that, that could maybe to help someone with the loss of things? Well, um, grieving is very important right. when one experiences loss. So it's not about, oh, don't feel bad. Do this and you'll feel better. Right. Because um, that there's real value in the depth of emotion and, and experience around, it's true, it's real. The loss of someone or um, um, that is close to you, meaningful, etc. cetera. Um, at the same time, there is a completion to that. And, um, and a part of, you know, there, there might be an exercise or two here around gratitude, appreciation, etc., cetera, which helps in the completion. Because on the one hand, whoa, I'm so, I'm so, um, I feel so badly about, you know, Genevieve is no longer in my life. And I'm very grateful for all of what she brought to me and her memory and the wonderful aspects of who we were together will continue to live in my heart. So there's both a grieving and a proper placement of all of why you're grieving, especially in the heart, that might assist in moving from the stage of grief to the stage of acceptance and then um, positive memory of all of who you were together. 
Yeah, it's just that the last few years were quite tragic in terms, obviously, it was death by misadventure, which I think was kind of overdose. And um, I'd known her since she was a kid. So it's kind of hard. Um, yeah. And the grieving, you know. well, in the grieving, I, my own view is that one needs to assist in the grieving as long as it's still intense and needs to be done. You need okay. to complete that process. And that could take five days. It could take two months. Um, and so I think your being there in support of her being in the process and at the same time being you know, available when it seems like the time is right mm -hmm. to begin to move into a different side. But right. it's not about, you know, you've been crying long enough. Let's get on with life. <laughs> oh, I'd never but, do that to anyone. <laughs> but, but, you know, people do that. And that's not what it's about. It's about let's now move this from a feeling of loss to a feeling of gratitude of who we have been together. And let's keep her or him alive in our hearts and all of what he or she brought into my life. Because I'm a better person for, you know, that experience, we'll put it that way. Um, and so, um, yeah, like, cause, cause I'm going back to what you said about random acts of kindness. And I learned how to crochet in 2018. And I said to myself, I was just gonna, I give to people who are like loved, respected, and appreciate. So I've been releasing things out into the wild because these people didn't even know they were going to get it. And some people that don't even know me. And I was just, and ever since then, um, yeah. I feel like the making of things has actually rewired my brain. And I've noticed mm. once I started to focus on, on what I want, because I was always giving to others, everything I do is always about so like others. And I've never kind of, it's, I find it really hard trying to do things for myself because I always put others first and I get trampled on most of the time. Um, and, and I just can't help it. My mother's always telling me off. So how old are you now? When are you ever going to learn? <laughs> just like probably never. But I noticed things have started coming to me in strange ways, which I never expected and ideas and all of that. And because my imagination runs riot most of the time, most people run away when they start. They're just like, oh, no, can't cope with it. <laughs> just, but things are starting to come together now for things that I actually want yeah. and want to bring about. And people are saying yes to me. And it was just like weird, those feelings. But I do think it's all, all uh, like I'm making my friend uh, a throw um, and making her stuff. So she'll she'll get that. Um, but she's yeah. really difficult to buy for. Um, but I just worry because she was depressed before. Um, I'm just worried that she might go on a downward spiral and may never get over this, you know? Well, and two other thoughts come to mind. One is, as you're aware, in some cultures, they have what they call a wake, which is a celebration mm -hmm. rather than a, a sense of loss. It's a celebration for you know, all the different reasons they celebrate. Right. And, um, you know, it's, it's one of my, my wife asked me the other day, you know, what do you want, what do you want us to do when you die? And, you know, I hadn't even thought about it. Um, but I said, you know, she said, for example, tell me what music you want us to play. Right. And that I started thinking about because I have some favorite music musical pieces that I love to listen to and they're upbeat and you know da, 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 da. so I've started to make a list of those um but you know I'm fascinated by the cultures that celebrate and then I learned something recently I was at a um a funeral for a member of the family and here you know in Bolivia it's a heavily catholic country and so you know especially the older generations, all believe in there's a better life after this life. And so I was, I was struck by how many people were sad in the funeral, because I thought, I thought we all believe they have a better life going. Why aren't we saying, hey, great. And I realized, <laughs> you know, it's not because of 
it's not a sadness about the person who died and what's happening to him or her, but it's a sadness about the loss we have of our relationship with the other. And so that's a part of, you know, I think the grieving process. We want to be okay about saying goodbye, recognizing that probably the adventure after this is, you know, has liberated them from the suffering, etc. Um, but it was instructive for me to recognize that it's, I think it's more connected to our own sense of what we have lost by losing the other um, and how important it is that we acknowledge and grieve for that loss and then um, celebrate how much they've met in our lives and that we keep with us forever. Right, okay, thanks for that. Uh, so Vladimir, Vladimir yeah. has his hand up for a long time. I'm sorry, what was that? I said Vladimir has his hand up. He's had his I hand up for a while. He's gone. I, sorry. Oh, he's come back. Oh, there he is, Vladimir, quick. Quick, Vlad. Tell us, ask us, talk. You're on mute. I'm, I'm, there you go. I'm sorry, Jim. I, I You were frozen for a, for a second there, and uh, and I got reconnected then. So, it's great to hear you. I mean, I, I'm, as you were speaking, I was I was going into the mood. Um, very beneficial, and uh, the last um, discussion, Carrie, about grieving. It you know something that I didn't want to mention, but something that you said absolutely agree and and realize the importance of grieving from personal experience of my father uh, uh, dying very uh, suddenly. Uh, and then of course, going through a lot of pain and, and, and sadness with people coming to tell me that life goes on. And I, it was a difficult thing to, to yeah. hear because I didn't know what to do with that. Yeah. Uh, I did know what to do with my sadness. Um, so what I did, and I, of course, it happens only once in lifetime that that father died. So I was going to his grave. His his um, uh, grave is not far. The cemetery is not far from where I lived at the time. And I would go every day, not because I I I felt I need to. Sometimes I would go twice, and I would sit at a grave, and and invoke, and even nurture my sadness. Don't didn't I didn't want to get away from it. I felt that that getting into that mood was, was something that was needed um, at, at being, the, being there, not getting away from grave and not getting away or assuming that life goes on. Of course, life goes on. Life, life, is, life is a kind of thing that goes on, but it's not, that's not a kind of thing that I was, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't, I didn't, I, I, I could use. So, so within, I think for, for maybe a month or even two months or even more, it was, it was a daily thing for me. And I was looking forward to going to a place, especially in the evenings and, and early night when, when the cemetery was entirely peaceful and dark, that I will sit alone and go deep into the darkness and, and being there close to his body, <laughs> um, that body. And I have to say, uh, with, with, without that experience, I would I would probably never be able to understand, mm. um, or or continue living without him. Mm -hmm. So that's the that's the comment. The other the other just brief comment to what you said about the the exercises which I which I and I wrote I've, I've written down my sort of gratitudes and all that, and I realized. I mean. Many, many years ago, I was out somewhere and four stray dogs attacked me um, very badly. Um, and so if he, I remember trying to fight uh, and thinking whether I should run away, but I know that if I started running away, they'll follow. And I know that fighting them um, wasn't, and I didn't know what to do. If, if we use that as a metaphor, or a metonymy, I don't know what a better word is that, but a metaphor of life that we are 
a person attacked by, by, by stray dogs. What do we do? Uh, do we remain calm? Do we fight? Or do we run away? How would, I mean, with, with these exercises, what do they teach you in the situation like that? Because I sometimes feel that making myself good and embracing the, the values that you just showed us, and which is incredible when I, when I myself, and I go out in kind of the interpersonal universe in which these, which these things don't apply. And more and more I see stray dogs, right? And I'm thinking I'm actually producing myself, you know, I'm almost doing something that is counter-revolutionary given what's happening in the world. I'm disequipping myself to deal with the world of stray dogs. How do I equip myself without uh, looking condescending where the stray dog starts to bark and I and the, and then I, you know, speak from from high above, um, and and that even enrages the dog even more. My equanimity creates a problem for a person to which it is applied. Well, a couple of things you said are important to me. One is going into the darkness. I mean, none of this is to suggest that there isn't value in the darkness. Um, you know, for example, we talk about the shadow, which holds all of those pieces of ourselves that, you know, keep us from doing stuff. And at the same time, our shadow holds extraordinary energy for our growth. Um, so, you know, I like a, a book uh, Nan, um, Connie Schweig once wrote in which she talks about romancing the shadow. So, and, and that's a part of the darkness we feel that, that, you know, it is not to be avoided because it's real and it's a part of us. Um, and as um, we were just talking, um, there is an element, at a, there's a time for being in the darkness. And here are some exercises for when you feel you're done to help you come back out again. And that's the thing, you see, that these are not like everything, something bad happens, you know, think positive. That's not what this is about. It's about all of those experiences you describe are real and valuable in our lives. For example, and this is my own view on this stuff, being around people who, you know, are contrary to the way I would prefer to be in the world, I look at it as he's my teacher. See, he's pushing me to respond the way what I would call the cave person responded. And that's an opportunity for me to both acknowledge the truth of that and decide that, you know, that's when um, you make a choice. Choices are there each time to not have that dominate me. And, in, and, and your last comment is, you know, and this is really hard we are not responsible for how someone else feels. And that's very, very difficult. You know, I'm practicing equanimity and this guy is getting upset at me. That's his journey, not mine. And I need to, on the one hand, acknowledge the ripples of my equanimity and what it's affecting in the world, but not necessarily allow those responses to change who I am. And that's a, that's a, it's a, it's a very difficult task in life, it seems to me. Um, and so, you know, a part of what um, comes to me before I go to sleep, if I, you know, remember, which I don't always remember to do, but I've remembered to review things I'm grateful for in the day, 
one of the things is I'm grateful for so-and-so who really, who, who created with, who, who, who's, see, the thing is, it's not like who made me angry because that's not true. I made myself angry, you see? It isn't about the other person. It's always about us. And we need to be responsible for who we are. That's about becoming more fully human, being responsible for who I am inside of me and deciding if that response is the appropriate next action for me versus something happens, it stimulates something in my brain or wherever to take a certain action that is not the appropriate one in terms of helping to build a new and more sustainable civilization, become more fully human. So, you know, I don't have any answers for your dilemma because it's deep and real for all of us. But within it is contained an opportunity to rise into our higher nature in a certain sense. And a part of our just simple, not get out of the darkness, but maybe find a little bit of light in there somewhere, um, that changes your brain so that the next time the darkness isn't quite as dark. Um, it's a slow but regular process. And these are just examples of, of sort of practices we can do within ourselves to um, offer a little bit of, of ointment over the wound that we feel, but not deny the wound because it's real. And, um, but we have a way of healing ourselves with some of these practices, that's all. And there, you know, I'm sure other things that are even better. And, and um, you know, if the darkness is too dark, you ought to see a third person. You ought to see a, a, someone who can assist you to travel in that darkness because there are places of darkness within each of us that we're not equipped to go in alone. And we need to be careful about that. Jim, thank you so much. I mean, one of the things that I noted as you were talking, one of the things that I'm grateful is that I'm able to learn uh, important truths from from others, including yourself. But since you quoted Epictetus in one of the in one of the one of the slides, and I and I read Epictetus regularly, um, I'm sure some some of you are familiar with Epictetus as a as a Stoic philosopher from from ancient from from Roman period, who was initially a slave, and he served in a in a wealthy Roman um, household which was attended by people like Seneca and others uh, great. So when he was very, very young boy, um, his master decided to play with him uh, in front of his guests. And because they were all drunk, the master took Epictetus's leg and started to bend it to show his strength and also to show his power over a slave. Um, when, when, became, when the pain became intolerable, Epictetus said, you are going to break my leg. And when his master continued and broke his leg, Epictetus replied, I told you, you were gonna break my leg. And this, this, this is the, the story that happened according to historians which made Epictetus who he was. And I think that story in itself is in, in, of incredible value in when speaking about what happens and how you keep, I mean, this is of course extreme. We don't want to be in, in Epictetus' position, but it's keep, to keep in mind the fact that he is a slave at the time so that he, he is taught not to have the same right as the master, so therefore that his body is owned by the master and the fact that the only thing that he could say was that he was right when he warned him that this was going to happen. To me, this is the, the essence of stoicism. And I think there is a lot of elements that you, you were telling us here is uh, the importance of judging the impression 
before they become angry. I'm working a lot of, on anger, my own anger, uh, and trying to understand the, the anger. And I think this is um, where Epictetus the sense and Seneca, of course, come, and including yourself, the kind of things that you said today in, in this way was absolutely right on spot for me. Thank you. So um, I want to give us a chance for any other comments, but first let me just do the last two slides, just so you'll know they're here. So here's a little um, what I call practice guidelines, and you'll see in the PDF they're here, you know, and, and um, with the smiling, then being on your own side, we talked about it a little bit. And what we haven't really talked about, but has been a part of what I've learned and practiced is, is be mindful of our participation in the larger eco field. That we're, you know, we exist in a much larger, what we might call eco field than just what we see around us. And, you know, in, in Bolivia or in the South or in the Andes, we talk about Pachamama, which is the spirit of planet Earth. It's Mother Earth in a sense. And so um, find a way to give thanks and be appreciative of, you know, Mother Earth, which really is the sustenance from which we emerge. And then a couple of questions that can help us now and then. What am I grateful for today? What do I need to do for me today? How can I show myself love today? What do I look forward to today? What can I do that'll make me happy? Just some, you know, a couple of questions to review in the morning to help set the pattern for the day. I mean, um, you know, one of the things that people recommend is that, you know, what you do in the very beginning of your day sets a template in a sense, an energetic template for the day. So one of the recommendations is do not do your email first thing in the morning because then what is happening is everybody else is setting the template for your day, not you. So, you know, it's important in the morning to, you know, be happy about a few things, etc. but maybe look at these questions and just, you know, 10 minutes or something, even over breakfast or whenever, um, set a template for how your choice of your day is going to go. And then I always include this because it's important and it's much more difficult again with the COVID situation. Um, but hugs have a significant positive impact on the body, things we most of us never even think about. And here are 10 benefits um, thinking about, especially for children. Um, and, and um, you know, I remember uh, with my relationship with my father, um, you know, we grew up in a time when men shook hands. Um, and as um, what, what came to be known as shoulder to shoulder intimacy, where men and women would look at each other and communicate directly. And men would go for a walk and stand next to each other, shoulder to shoulder intimacy, and talk about what was going on without actually having a direct eye to eye contact. And I remember um, a certain point at which my mother said to me when I was, after I shook hands with my father, she said, you know, Jim, everyone else I know, I, everyone else I see whom you know, you hug them when you greet them. Why don't you hug your father? And from that day on, we always hugged each other and it had a huge positive impact on our lives. I mean, I, I have actually written a little essay on my relationship with my father. If anyone's interested, I'll send it to you because some of this had a huge impact on that. Um, and it's something I think is, is really important for people to recognize before your parents um, leave the body and go on to whatever's next uh, to complete that relationship. So I want to do one last thing quickly in our imagination. Um, I want us all to just, just close your eyes and deepen into the sense of our connection to one another on this call. And imagine 
a group hug. Imagine that each of us is connecting with everyone else on this call with, in a sense, our virtual arms. And we can hug each other as a group energetically right now because of the closeness that we've achieved in the last hour and a half. So let's just have a group hug for 15 seconds and feel our connection to one another. And I wanna thank all of you for participating for so much longer than we planned. Um, and for, you know, and for all of what you've brought to all of this, I really appreciate it. Um, you see then there's references. And I've also added, you know, a number of other slides that I think are important um, that I put in the appendix for all of you to review once, um, you know, you get the PDF, et cetera. I wanna, and I wanna say one last thing, what I've done with my classes at Ubiquity is that after each course, I've established a monthly, um, in a sense, community meeting of all of the students who are interested in which we do just what we've been doing as a discussion for an hour, an hour and a half. Um, having anyone, it's not, there's no instruction. It's just a, what I call a, um, um, a sort of a neuroscience club of Ubiquity University where anybody who's been involved with these discussions can join. And we all just come together for an hour and everybody tells their stories about what's going on. And one of the things that has impressed me is how over the last year during COVID and the, and the challenges, um, how many people have said one or two of these exercises have really been important to help um, them get through a challenge or so that happened because of uh, the restrictions in the house, et cetera. So I will let everyone here know when we schedule the next such um, neuroscience club meeting and you'll all be invited um, and just attend for attend or not attend. But I thank everyone for participating and joining again after, you know, two weeks ago, Saturday, I didn't quite get through all this stuff, but I, you know, I really like hearing from all of you and learning about these things. So I'll give us one last um, brief couple of minutes for anyone who wants to say anything and, and, um, and then we'll close it up for the day. Comments, questions, um, accolades, they're always I, I just wanted to thank you, Jim, and everybody else here. So um, thank you. This has been great because this is my first time learning about all this. So it's been um, it's been excellent. So thanks and I look forward to seeing it at the, the, the club hangout. <laughs> oh, great, great. Thank you, Carrie. I wanted to say um, thank you to Angelo for organizing this whole experience because it's been really, really beneficial okay. and thank you Jim for sharing all your knowledge and research and wisdom and I wanted to also say thank you to Vladimir and to Carrie for bringing up difficult real world situations because that just really made everything so practical and so real and mm -hmm. uh, I'm grateful that you two were willing to be so vulnerable. Any other comments or Vladimir? Just, just to say thank you again to, to Jim and everyone else. Yeah, uh, just a brief plug um, for the Sacred Inclusion Network. Um, the third Saturday of every month, um, which I don't remember what it is, it's like in a couple of weeks, um, our next one is about li liminal, living in the liminal world. And um, a fellow from the UK is a good friend of mine is going to do it and you'll get some invitations to that. So thanks for participating. Thank you so much, Jim, for being so generous with sharing your wisdom. Well, and also, Angelo, I'll, uh, what I said last week, uh, last session, there is a 
um, uh, uh, a meeting coming up on your calendar that is focused on Rick Hansen's book on happiness. And so um, everyone ought to look for that and potentially participate because that's one of the great, he's one of the really great teachers of all of this. Um, so I encourage you to participate in that meeting of Angela's group. So thank you all, appreciate it. We'll be in touch. Thank you, Jim. Thank you all. Thank Bye. You.